this is James from Octopark. Thank you for tuning in. This is another episode of the Control Listen podcast. Today we have a special guest for you. It is Ashri Cohen uh, from the Israeli tech firm Cyborg. Uh, do you want to tell people a little bit about what your company does, what the technology is, and uh, what you're all about? Yes, of course. Thank you, James, uh, for inviting me. So, um, a bit about uh, Cyborg. Uh, so Cyborg is um, uh, an Israeli high-tech company using uh, artificial intelligence and big data in order to uh, uh, resolve a big issue in the electronics assembly industry, which actually um, uh, related to materials. When I'm saying materials, I'm, I'm talking about the component itself uh, that are being uh, assembled over the boards. Uh, today, if you look on the on the uh, risk that you expose during the assembly process, you will find that um, there are two parts, the process side and the, and the material side. The process side is pretty much covered by very good, strong companies like ASM, Fuji, these guys. However, when you look on the material, on the component side, you will find no one covering this part. It means that all components are actually not covered, not being uh, analyzed during the assembly or before the assembly. And of course, this makes this um, a side of the equation uh, very risky to whoever uh, produces electronic uh, uh, components. What we do is we analyze online, um, um, not using any hardware, any dedicated hardware, just utilizing the native, natural capabilities of the lines uh, in order to uh, get all the images, inspect all the images, and provide a very quick feedback to the line whether the component, the discrete component is a good one or a bad one. If it's a bad one, we sort it out and we say, why is it a bad one? Um, and at the end of the day, we are collecting huge amount of data. So at the end of the day, the system is being used for additional purposes like getting uh, deeper analysis, um, um, analytics of data, you know, we are using big data. So we are able to take billions of billions of components for each and every customer and just provide them the, um, the uh, right smart insights. So at the end of the day, uh, people can start getting informed decision rather than relying their uh, decisions on, you know, statistics or whatever. Is this sort of something where looking at it now, you think, why wasn't someone doing this sooner? Why they, need, they, they would like to do this? Yeah, it's like, why has no one done this before you? It's, it ah, seems yeah, like something that should have been done. Yeah, that's an excellent question. Well, it's not that people didn't want to do this. Everyone knows that they need to do this. The problem is that there was no available um, technology to do this. If you try to use the standard machine vision technology and you have hundreds of millions of different types of components, then um, you will have to ask for each and every component, you will have to ask at least one golden unit in order to uh, use it as a reference uh, uh, item. That's, that's not practical actually, when you have hundreds of millions of components and to ask it from each and every, uh, every customer, well, it won't work. Um, and artificial intelligence allows us to do this without asking any uh, golden units or without doing any you know, specific uh, critical requirements with the, with the customer. We just see the components, we learn the components during the time. I, 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 we see 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, and then we, can, we, we generate the model, and that's it. We are ready to start analyzing and provide a, 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 the results. And again, not AI, not big data was available up until the last few years, so now you see this capability finally evolve. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, I guess I want to ask, so why is this so much of a game changer in an industry that's so competitive? How, how does this really help a company make a difference? Yeah, um, so, um, you know, general statement, but truth, uh, electronics is just growing. It's just significantly growing. And it grows just because it has to enable all the technology that happened today in the world. And, you know, the world is getting more and more techno technology based. Um, mm -hmm. And in order to assemble all these electronics properly, you have to develop new tools. Um, and that's a game changer because, as I said, up until today, you could not 
see 100% of the materials all over the world and today you are able to do this so why not that's that's the right tool to do this this is how game changer um, uh, it is you know more than this if you look uh, moving forward um, the products need to be competitive um, while everyone are developing technologies you see very strong uh, competition today so in order to be competitive you need to have better cost and better reliability of your product so your reputation will become higher than the, the other uh, rivals and again you can do this only by using automations and by, 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 by using such great strong technologies that will position you differently from all the others so that's that's number two why it's a it's a it's a game changer. Great, yeah, makes a lot of sense. So, you kind of answered this question already in the last question, but I'll just see if you have any other thoughts on it. But why do you think quality assurance and reliability has become so important in the company's reputation? You know, in the in, in today's world, technology is almost everything. I mean, everyone relying on technology so heavily. I mean, let, let's look on a few examples. Aerospace, all the, you know, all the aircraft that are uh, thousands of them or tens of thousands of them are, are currently in the air uh, uh, taking passengers from one point to another point. Uh, medical devices that are doing medical tests to, to uh, uh, people. Uh, automotive, so everyone today are, tr are driving cars, but cars today are more computer than, than any, you know, mechanical device yeah, like, like it's yeah. been uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So, you know, um, technology is heavily involved today and everyone relies on technology. So, you know, when you deal with aerospace, with medical, with automotive, you cannot assume good enough product. You can't. That's yeah. li live, live involved here. So it's just one example. I mean, even in data center, everyone would like to get a good service. Uh, you know, um, uh, even me as a, as a customer of you know of Facebook, of Google, of these guys, um, I, I I see as a standard uh, good reliable product. I mean, there is no other option. I wouldn't accept a product that is working you know so so sometimes it's up sometimes it's down it's not acceptable so this is the world that we are living in and this is why quality and reliability today uh, uh getting a, a very major part uh, on on the industry sure i guess as well this is there's so many options out there nowadays if, if one company isn't doing things well you can always just jump to something else. It's not like in the past where there was one specialized person that did this. Now you have a whole industry you can choose from. You totally got it. Exactly. The competition is just driving everyone to be better. That's that's the bottom mm -hmm. line. And to be better, you need to be more creative, take more risk, but to be more creative, be more open mm -hmm. to uh, adopt new technologies, new capabilities, uh, you know, um, rely less on people or, you know, maybe you can take all your people and utilize them in you know, a different way while the, mm -hmm. you know, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work will be done by software, will be done by machines, will be done by robots. And that's, uh, that's definitely the directions that the people are adopting today in order to be more competitive. Right. I mean, uh, on the topic of AI and jobs and that sort of thing, uh, I know there's a lot of people out there that are kind of scared of AI taking their job. Are you of the belief that it's not going to take people's jobs, it's going to sort of, I guess, repurpose people into different areas, um, allowing them to focus on new things while AI handles the heavy lifting? Definitely the second. I mean, uh, I don't believe that uh, people will lose their jobs and uh, stay unemployed. Maybe, you know, in the short term it can happen for some period of time, but then but, but that's it. I mean. People will always be required. The, the great news from my perspective is that people will have to learn more and find the added value they can bring as people uh, that, that, that the AI cannot bring. And you know, all the, let's call it the dark work or the dirty work, let's leave it to automation, let's leave it to AI, let's leave it to this uh, smart software and, and, and machines. Yeah, it's. 
I think people need to look at AI from the perspective of it's a tool. It's, it's not actually a threat. If it's unregulated, I mean, that's the whole debate is about how do we regulate this going forward? It's such a complex issue. It's such a complex industry we know so little about. So we're going to see that unfold over the next, I say, decade or so. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, yeah, I, I agree, and I have to tell you that um, it may be risky, probably. I can tell you that in the industry, that's going to be super useful. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change the way the industry is acting and looking and performing, for sure. So this is why I'm not afraid from any adoption of AI technology into the industry. Maybe other areas, you know, maybe. I'm not a philosopher, so... I'll, I'll, I'll be very focused on the, on the, on the uh, uh, vertical, on the place that I'm, I'm, I'm good at and I know how things work and that's the industry and I believe it's going to be very right. helpful for this industry. Great to hear. Altium 365 lets you hold the fastest design reviews ever. Share your designs from anywhere and with anyone with a single click. It's easy. Leave a comment tagging your teammate, and they'll instantly receive an email with a link to the design. Anyone you invite can open the design using a web browser. Using the browser interface, you're able to comment, mark up, cross-probe, inspect, and more. Comments are attached directly to the project, making them viewable within Altium Designer, as well as through the browser interface. Give it a try and get started with Altium 365 today. So I want to ask, you obviously operate with two different types of companies. Uh, you work with OEMs and EMS. Yeah. Uh, what would you say are the main differences between their needs in, in your space? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, every time that uh, I'm sitting with a customer uh, or even with investors, so they always ask, um, but what is the difference? Why you can't sell to Flex or to JBL, but you can sell to Cisco or these guys? Well... <laughs> The, 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 those are two different creatures. Uh, mm -hmm. EMS, while EMS are, uh, is looking always uh, on productivity, uh, increasing throughput, increasing capacity, and increasing margins, because this is what they are doing. They just kind, you need to imagine a kind of a machine. They have their input, they have their output, that's it. This is their part in the chain. They are not owning the product. They don't care about the reputation behind this product. They don't care about the functionality behind this product. And I fully understand these guys. They need to get, they get all the definitions, by the way, from their customers, the OEM. So they get a, a, the bill of materials defined. Uh, they, get, they get the, um, who should they buy from, uh, the AVL, AML, whatever. Um, they even get the testing equipment or the test procedures they need to operate. So at the end of the day, they do exactly what the OEM is instructing them. So this is, this is the, 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 uh, this creature called EMS. And they are measured, by the way, the same exactly on these uh, parameters. So they need to make sure their productivity is getting higher, higher throughput with the same machines, not adding more, more uh, uh, capital equipment. Um, increasing their capacity, again, using the same resources, the same machines, the same areas, and at the end of the day, need to improve the margins, which are usually very lean. Now, let's, let's go to, to look on the other creature, the, 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 the OEM. So OEMs, you know, uh, they care about the totally different things. So, for example, reliability, you know, um, first, what driving them is reputation, again, because of the competition that we just discussed in, in, in the previous uh, questions. So um, uh, they would like to make sure the reputation is just getting improved so they can sell more and more and more and expand the market. Um, and for this, they need a high quality, high reliability. Um, they would like to beat the competition because they need to compete. Everyone provide the very similar technologies, very similar uh, solutions and and they would like to make sure they are able to meet commitment again it serves the uh, reputation side and they would like to make sure they are re reducing risks and by quality and by enforcing quality they will definitely uh, reduce risk so this is two different creatures no one should treat them the same and you know everyone is expert on his side but that's not the same 
great, great answer. Thank you. And then I wanted to ask, what do you see as, I guess, the trend in the last few years since since COVID happened in supply chain component sourcing and tech? Have you seen much difference over the last few years? Um, so, again, uh, so, well, components, I don't see a lot of change. I mean, the semiconductor industry is getting a more sophisticated, more productive. This is the semiconductor side, but, but the assembly, the electronic assembly uh, vertical is not really improving. I mean, if you get today into lines, you will find the same machines, you know, with some more features, less features, but the same machines, the same method, the same uh, uh, lines, uh, layout. So everything pretty much the same, let's say, in the, next, in the last uh, five years, everything looks the same. So I don't think that uh, anyone adopted any new mechanism or any new tools to uh, sort materials, sort uh, components. Um, in terms of process, yeah, they did a lot and they are today able to control the process very well. Very similar to, I mean, it's not really similar, but it's getting closer to the way the semiconductor industry are controlling the process. But the mm -hmm. controlling the materials, the components, yeah, there is no great improvement there. Interesting. What about supply scarcity, though, as in uh, actually finding components over the last few years? Has, oh, have you seen any issues there? Very sensitive, very sensitive um, uh, point. So, um, you know, component, eventually what you will see is that components uh, are getting into shortage and it always will happen. By the way, it's a, it's a kind of a sign. It happens like a sign. Sometimes uh, you have a great prices and sometimes you have extra components in the market, the, I think uh, 20, the, the second half of uh, 2020, all over 21 and the first half of 22 were just a disaster. It was a very, very tough yeah. period for the global supply chain. No components uh, were available. Um, and if you see, if you look today, what happening, so there are um, uh, two criteria that uh, people need to keep looking and keep their eyes on uh, related to availability, future availability of component. Um, the first one is what happening between US and China. And the second one um, is actually the investments being done. Let's start with the second one because this one is uh, simpler and, and, uh, and more straightforward. Uh, so for, for, for this one, um, you need to look on what investment are being done on the legacy semiconductors. Legacy semiconductor, which means, let's say, um, semiconductor being done on technologies uh, earlier than 60 nanometer. Mm -hmm. Not too much. Not too much investment. Most of the investments today in the world are being invested on the 16 on the 7 nano, on the 5 nano, now on the 3 nano, and additional technologies to improve the uh, density of the transistor within these semiconductors. And what does it mean? It means that uh, the legacy product, which will always be part of the board, let's say at least in the next uh, the 20 years, will become uh, less and less available in the market. Now, think about it. If you would like to buy a simple DC to DC device, you can't, you can't make it using a five nanometer technology. Even if you can, you won't transition so fast. There are for a, a whole industries which are not going to make a transition so fast because they did their qualification for the product. They won't start requalify all their product because now they have to consume a new technology. That's gonna be a big issue. Really big. Issue. Right. The second point is what happening between the uh, U.S. government and the China government. So what happens yeah. now? See what happens just recently with the gallium and germanium uh, uh, materials. So mm. now China are restricting these materials from from being shipped to you know global global customers. 
and they are controlling, you know, um, uh, around 70 or 60 or 70 percent uh, of these material are being provided by China. So that's mm. a big issue. Now, you know, I'm not sure that everyone knows, but most of the chips, including, including uh, uh, gallium and, and germanium, sometimes gallium, sometimes germanium, but these uh, materials, if they will be missing, so this challenge of keep providing uh, the increasing trend, the increasing requirement uh, or increasing demand of the industry is going to be even more challenging than what it, it, it's been up until now. So I think um, availability of components is going to be a big issue in the next uh, coming years. Yeah, I think everyone's feeling that that way. It's uh, it's unprecedented times. But by the way, it, it 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 generates a different market, which everyone really concerned for, which is the secondary market or the counterfeit market. You know, secondary, mm -hmm. by the way, not always is a sec is, is a counterfeit, but 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 counterfeit comes through the secondary market, and that's a big issue. Right. That you know, by again by using uh, sophisticated tools like AI, like big data, like exactly like what we do is a good solution for this problem as well. If you already decided to start consuming from the open market, at least you have to develop the capability to deal or to sort material properly before you get it into your lines. Yeah, quality control, 100%. Exactly. Right, well, that kind of brings us to the end of our time. Um, but before we finish, I just wanted to ask if people want to sort of reach out to the company or follow you on social media or anything like that, where should they do that? Yeah, well, we have our uh, LinkedIn page, we have our um, um, web page, and we are going to uh, participate in the Productronica uh, exhibition on next uh, November. Uh, we're going to be there. We're going to uh, present uh, in uh, the same booth with Fuji. So um, I, I'm, I'm more than inviting everyone to join us in Productronica. Great. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been uh, fascinating talking to you. Great. My pleasure.